Okay, here's what we're doing today. We're talking about money, supply, and demand. We discussed, we began money supply next day, and we're going to finish it in the first hour of Hell or High Water. Then we're going to do money demand, put together the determination of interest, and the relationship between interest and investment. Okay? So, you know, there's a lot of explanation here. I try to point certain things out to you. So you really, part of it is to point out our choice of data, and this and that. To point out to you that this, this analysis is not pie in the sky. It is theoretical, there may be some issues with it. But essentially, what determines money supply is very mechanical and much the way that we discuss here. All right, so what we have as the backdrop so far is this. Money is liquid, which means it can be used immediately to buy something. As such, in the modern world, the amount of money that a person has at their disposal, disposition, is... Now, if I said to you, Erica, how much money do you have, by the way? Today, huh? No, no. Erica has $20 a month. Yes or no? Do you believe her? No. Why not? Okay. She's a debit card. Yeah, she's got a debit card. Erica, cash is not the only component of money. The amount of money you have is the cash that you have on your person or say in your house, plus whatever deposit you can draw on immediately, either through debit or a check or something like that, right? So Money, please don't forget, money is, and this is like when I ask you, I'm going to see that a lot of there's going to be like questions and even more questions on this exam, what is money supply? Just stick to the formulas. When I say what is money supply, I don't run off and say, well, I think it's this. No. It is currency in circulation plus deposits. Every single time, you've got to remember that. If I, within like half an hour, I'll have to burn you, you'll forget. Right? Always. When I say what money supply is, check. What's the currency in circulation? What's the deposits? What is the change in money supply? Check. What is the ch change in currency in circulation? What is the change in deposits? All right. Money supply. Then we said the legal tender is issued by, in the modern world, by the state. In this case, and usually by the central bank. Legal tender used to be a money commodity, gold, silver, whatever. It was linked and basically to the value of the commodity by itself. It circulated as that. But for various reasons, first thing, the money commodity became coinage, and the idea that you could displace actual circulation of gold or silver coins by weight and fineness, by paper that represented them, occurred you know, in, the, in the 19th century. And it also occurred to banks. So, so on one hand, governments could do that, the banks can do that as well. Then there's a separation at a certain point between any link between gold, silver, anything else, and paper money. Nowadays, you say we circulate in convertible paper money. It can't be converted to gold. It's sometimes called, sometimes called FIAT, F-I-A-T, which just means trust money. We use a Canadian dollar because we trust it. But actually, it has, you know, if you print, and we're going to see, there's a thing in that comes called a quantity theory of money. It turns out that that's a dominant, the, the dominant theory that overthrows a lot of our arguments about what causes recessions in the 19, this overthrows those arguments in the 1970s. I think it's completely bold with that, so that's not here and there. But the quantity theory of money basically says uh, the value of money is determined by the amount of money that you issue. And this is true if it's pure paper. We know that every single inflation you know, virtually, if you double the amount of paper money, or rather, if you double the amount of money, in particular, the known issue of the government, the central the, the government, you double prices. But we're not going to discuss that, of course, right? So but the main thing is, for us, legal tender is issued by the state. If the state issues more legal tender, we're going to be concentrating on whether or not that affects interest rates. But there's another argument that says it affects prices. We're not discussing it. It's an important issue, we're not discussing it. Okay, so money supply is that which is issued by the state. When and before 1930, there was no possibility of either fiscal policy, which we've already discussed, which is, I mean, there's a possibility, but it didn't occur, which is that governments can influence the economy by spending or cutting taxes. It didn't occur because governments simply balanced the budget. 
If governments went to war, they somehow survived the war, and after the war, they taxed people and they paid for the war. If governments built a bridge, they taxed people and built a bridge. The only thing the government thought about was, whatever we do, we have to tax people and pay for it. We do not want a deficit. We do not want a surplus, consciously or, or purposely. Nor do we, if we, we don't take, we, we, so taxes are determined by balancing the budget. Expenditures are determined by balancing the budget. We've seen that the Keynesian idea, or the, uh, the government interference in the marketplace idea at the macro level is predicated on the idea that you can run a government deficit, either from cutting taxes or increasing spending, to stimulate an economy out of the recession. If an economy is inflationary, that is, it's expanding too quickly and goes beyond full employment, you can reduce government spending or increase taxes to slow it down. That's called government, that's called fiscal policy, and it doesn't exist before 1930. It really doesn't exist anywhere before 1933 in any significant amount, and even then, not much. Uh, in Canada, for example, it doesn't really exist in any way until after World War II, except unconsciously, say, World War II. Um, then we're, we're discussing monetary policy. It does not exist before 1930, because countries are on the gold standard which means they cannot change their money supply. What we're going to see here is if you can change your money supply, you can change interest rates. The danger, again, which I say we don't discuss in this class, is that that can cause inflation. Forget it. So changing the money supply can change interest rates. This is what we're looking at. But again, before 1930, you couldn't do that. Now, it turns out, by the way, Keynes' book came out in 1936. Uh, and the, the Great Depression hit so hard internationally that it basically knocked everybody off the gold standard. They couldn't stay at the gold standard because our <coughs> international trade fell so much that gold was sort of flying between countries and people couldn't, they couldn't control it. So people went off the gold standard and then it was like, you know, what is his name is, he stuck in his thumb and pulled out a pump and then tasted it and went, ooh, this is good. You know, so it turned out by 1930 people went, hey, wait a minute. We're not connected to the gold standard. We can change interest rates. And Britain, by the way, did that in the 1930s. It's called the easy money policy. This was before Keynes lowered interest rates because they could print any amount of money they wanted, right? Lowered interest rates. There was no word need to worry about inflation. It was a depression, after all. And the lower interest rates stimulated housing in Britain. So both of these, that, that comes about kind of accidentally, and then Keynes writes about it. So we're discussing, again, I guess my, my tangent here is to say, if you don't, if you can't increase the legal tenure, you can't have money supply, that you can't have monetary policy. So having inconvertible paper money, i.e. paper money printed by the state that is not convertible to anything, allows us to have monetary policy, number one. And we're going to see that's what it is. So then we go back. Legal tenure is issued by the state. Now, it turns out that legal tender issued by the state, as we talked about last day, is held by the public, and that which the public does not want, they put into banks. And strictly speaking, at this level, but there's another piece I'm not telling you yet, but I will tell you, then the sum total of the legal tender, first of all, it's absolutely true, the sum total of the legal tender in the society is either outside banks or inside banks. That's it. So when I say to you, this is the legal tender issued by the Bank of Canada, which I will do. The Bank of Canada issued $20 billion, printed $20 billion worth of notes, and got them out to you people by buying bonds, as we're going to see. So that there's $20 million worth of legal tender outside the Bank of Canada. And I tell you that the public has $15 million. My question then is, how much does the bank, how much does the bank have? Well, how much does the bank have? Five million. Where else would it go? The only place it can go is in the banks. So it divides, right? That's a, a fundamental idea. Now it turns out banks can have another reserve. They can have a deposit at the bank account. Just like Erica, you know, you shouldn't let her run around for the $20. Dollars. That's a little way too little, right? Too dangerous. She'd have that kind of money and some mad money and some cab money and some other kind of money, right? So that you can be raw. But anyway, no matter. The, 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 Eric has $20 in cash, but she also can merely go to the ATM 
deep, have $100 in a minute, right? Similarly, the, bank, the, the banks have their cash, plus they have their deposits at the Bank of Canada. They can go to the Bank of Canada and say, hey, you know, we, we need cash, and the Bank of Canada will give it to them immediately. If they're short of any bucks, if they have a million dollars on deposit at the Bank of Canada, the Bank of Canada sends over an honor card. So strictly speaking, the reserves of the private banks are the cash in their vaults and their deposits at the Bank of Canada. Okay, strictly speaking. Now in terms of the back up a bit here, the United States is the worst banking system in the world, flat out. Now they just, I could actually talk now for 24 hours about the bank crises in the United States and how they screwed it up here, there, and anywhere else, and why the Canadian banking system is so much better. But it turns out, basically, a lot of what we learn here is American banking practice. Because their banks were so bad, they had to have an official legal reserve. We never did in Canada before 1935. In, before 1935, we do not have a central bank. There's not another country in the world that doesn't have a central bank after 1925. Like, that doesn't have a central bank after 1927 New Zealand, and their bank is the Bank of Australia. Canada has no central bank. Number one, there is no required reserves in Canada before 1935. The banks can do essentially whatever they want. There are limitations on them, and they're fairly strict. So one of the limitations, by the way, is the Canadian banks have to print every month a full accounting of their you know, coins and notes and loans of this amount and this and that. We have, therefore, the best banking system in the world, the best banking statistics in the world. Right from 19, 1867, it's phenomenal. The U.S. has nothing like that, and Britain has nothing like that. But we have it just because the banks had to print and publish every month exactly what the situation was. And the pain banks are big. They're chartered across the country, which means they can spread the risk across the country. They have a bank in Saskatchewan, and there's a harvest failure in Saskatchewan. If the bank only existed that, it would likely fail. Because the, the, the farmers would be needing money, they would take all the reserves out of the bank, and the bank fails. But not a problem. The Canadian bank simply draws money from a bank in Toronto or a bank in um, BC or whatever, right? Canadian banks, by you know, our constitution, are chartered federally. Every one of them can have branches anywhere, and they do. Therefore, they're very large and the risk is spread over the country. In the US, most of the banks before the 1930s, and still large numbers of banks in the United States, have branches only in the one state. So like a bank that's only in North Dakota, if there's a harvest failure in North Dakota, that bank is in serious trouble. But not in Canada, right? So our banks are big, they're hyper-efficient compared to US banks. As a matter of fact, in 1909, the biggest bank in the New York money market, which is the, one of the biggest markets in the world, the biggest bank is the Bank of Montreal. Number four is like the Bank of Commerce. Number nine is the Bank of Montreal, Bank of Royal Bank. Bing, 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 bing. And they're the most sophisticated banks because Canada has lots of exchange, like foreign tra trade. All our history has at least 25% exports and imports of GDP. The United States, except for the last 10 years, their exports and imports are 5% of GDP, right? Now we should discuss exports and imports in this class in the last, in this course, in the last class. We may not get to it, but only because the summer has two shorter, two fewer lectures. In the US, even their textbooks up until 10 years ago never mentioned exports and imports. They talk about the macro model is C plus I plus G. Who cares about exports and imports? They're irrelevant. They're the country's huge in the world, and they have huge exports and imports, but relative to their own GDP, it's minor, it's nothing, it's less than 5%. So their banks don't deal in international exchange, they don't deal in foreign borrowings to a large degree, whereas Canadian banks have to do that forever. So Canadian banks are really sophisticated compared to US banks, and they're really big, and they're profitable, they're more profitable than US banks because they're more efficient. So in terms of, you might say, do you think interest rates would be higher in Canada than in the United States in the last 100 years? Maybe by this much. The, the Canadian interest rates have been just a tiny bit higher. Partly because US interest rates can collapse to nothing at certain times for various reasons. But in general, ours are just that much higher. But here's the thing. Canadian banks pay a higher interest for their deposit. 
So what's the difference between the interest that banks charge on the loans and the interest that banks pay in their deposits is significantly smaller per dollar than in the US for most of our history. Why? But our banks are more profitable because they're bigger and more efficient, right? So we can go on and on and on. Another point, US, US said, well, your banks are big, and they might even be efficient, but they're more profitable because they're not competitive. There's only so many of them. It was always like, when we had 40 in the United States at 30,000 banks, when we had five, they had 10,000 banks, right? And the, the Americans would say, well, your banks are monopolistic. But this is one of the things I want you to recognize in Canada. When you drive in Canada, when you drive in the U.S., I can take you guys to anywhere in Saskatchewan, like Rose Town, Saskatchewan. It's a great town, 1,000 people. You know, but basically, in every Saskatchewan town, in the middle of the town, boom, where the crossroads meet, there it is, the business section of the town, there's four banks. The big banks are over. Every Canadian bank is in that town, and they face each other across the street. You see the same phenomenon in Toronto. Name an important intersection in Toronto, and I could say, oh, actually there's four banks there. There's three banks, there's two banks there. You still see the old banks. Sometimes they're not being used as banks. They're used as Starbucks or something like that. But most of the major intersections in Toronto, there's the four banks. If you go to U.S. towns, small towns like in North Dakota and places like that, they have one bank. The only bank in town, that's it. Total monopoly. So it's an interesting study in the issue of competition. When the United States had 30,000 banks, most of them had one bank per town and they were flat out in office. In Canada, there was the, every, the, our banks, there's only five for the country, but every single one of them was in every small town, right? So it's intriguing. Anyway, the big banks is kind of a little bit important. The, the fact that we have these big banks that spread the risk over the country makes us much less susceptible to U.S. banking crises, and our banks never have to worry about reserves. They're just that much more sophisticated than the U.S. But in the U.S., because their banks failed, they had uh, required reserves. And in Canada, we had no required reserves before 1935, and none after 1985, right? So in terms of all this, we're going to get to, so we don't have a bank in Canada. When the bank in Canada is first introduced, it's not because we don't have the best banking system in the world, it's because of this. We can't, the government of Canada can't issue legal tender because the notes are issued by the private banks. So the Bank of Canada is really founded to establish Canadian dollar as a Canadian legal tender that the government creates and therefore the government can change. That's why it's established, not because the banks are poor. Okay, so again, legal tender is issued by the central bank and the primary purpose right from the get-go, at least in Canada, is to change the money supply. All right, so then, now the money supply again, remember, is currency in circulation plus deposits. And then last day we discovered that the way that deposits expand, and in fact they expand much beyond the total currency in the society, is that banks keep, only need to keep a certain amount of reserve. When you go to a bank, the Bank of Montreal, for example, might have $20 billion worth of, of, of deposits. But they only have like $2 billion worth of reserves. They don't have to have, because basically people every day, they go into the bank and they deposit, others come into the bank and take out. In any given day, only 10% of all deposits change. So the banks realize that they don't, you know, they don't need, they all, they get, they're very careful to make sure they always have enough reserves. Now, in terms of sometimes banks might not have enough reserves. Something extraordinary can happen. So for example, like the Y2000 square scare, which you people might or might not remember because you were 10 years old or whatever you were, seven, do you remember that? Was that a big deal when you were seven years old, people? Probably not. But when the millennium turned from the, you know, the, the 1999 to 2000, computers had to be designed, a lot of computers in existence, people thought they couldn't have to handle 2000, that the banking system would be locked up until you know, they just freeze, the computers wouldn't operate, until you know, somehow we figured this out, how to make computers read 2,000. So it was a potential scare. And it meant that people were, there were possibly existed that literally you could not get any cash in the first week of January in the year 2000. So in that case, people actually rushed the banks and took money out, cash out. Now that would cause the banking system to collapse because they wouldn't have enough reserves to 
to deal with such a, a, a rush at that moment of time. But that's not a problem. All the bank, the central banks in the world just said fine. And they just gave the banks cash, basically here. And of course, the banks gave the cash out to the customers. The customers took extra money out. As soon as the scare was over, like two days later, they went, oh my god, I've got all my savings under my bed. And it all went back into the bank. It's not a problem. Similarly with like 9-11, everybody took, lots of people took money out of banks because they were afraid. The Federal Reserve in the U.S. just added cash into the banks temporarily. People took the money out and then they put it back in three days later. It's not a big deal, right? So in general, the banks have a reserve and they're very, you know, it's very predictable. And you know, the statistical models show how predictable it is. They don't have to worry. They, they, so this reserve is say 10%. So whatever cash they get, they lend out everything more than they need as a reserve because they make money from loans. Think of it yourself. If you've got $1,000 of cash sitting in your house, you're not earning income. So they don't want cash sitting in their bank. They want to lend it out. But they can't lend it all. All the $1,000 of cash that they get because somebody deposits, they only lend out $900. They keep 100 as a reserve. Because, of course, the bank, if a bank cannot give you, when you go to like, honor your check or honor your withdrawal, the bank fails. And if that happened, you get what we call our bank runs. People freak out. Oh, my God. The bank won't have any money. This actually happened in the U.S. during the Depression. As I said, 8,000 banks failed. As soon as people get a sniff that their bank doesn't have enough money, there's a famous shot of Shanghai in 1937, right? There's a Japanese economy. I don't know if it's 37. I can't remember. And you can see them, it's like from a, it's a picture of, a, of, 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 of Shanghai, the whole, the community is trying to get their money out of this bank, and the, they're just shoved right up against the, you know, the window of the bank, crutching their faces, desperate to get money, to get out of town. The bank doesn't have that kind of money at that moment of time. So, and then and everybody realizes there's only so much money we have. Okay, no, I just, I don't know if I mentioned this last day, but all the total reserves, say the Canadian banks have 50% of cash sitting in their vaults. But they also have another about 20% that they can raise within 12 hours. They have what are called call loans. They lend money to stockbrokers. And the stockbrokers give them stock, usually with about 130% of the loan. And if they want their money, they just phone the stockbroker up and say, I want the money now, we've got two hours. And that's about 5 to 10% of the loans. If the stock market can't come up with the money in two hours, they sell the stock. So they can raise like another 10% quickly. Then every day, you don't just have all, you've got all these different loans out. Then you've got loans. Every day there's a loan coming due. It might be a long-term, short-term loan. So every day there's like 5% of loans coming due. Within 24 hours, they can raise like maybe 30, 35% cash. And then other things. Now you'll notice this is a little secret about US banking. You don't want to lend a lot of money on mortgages. Only if you borrow along. If I borrow from somebody for five years, they lend me money as a bank for five years. At 3%, then I can lend it as a mortgage at 5%. But if people are lending or depositing for like a year or less, and I'm lending it at five years, what if they start withdrawing their money? I can't get the money from the household. And usually this is the basis of most US banking crises. It ends up that a lot of their money is tied up in mortgages, and if there's a housing crisis, so all the great, it happens every 20 years in the US, banking crises are somewhat related to this, the value of mortgages fall. So like that, the example I gave in North Dakota, first of all, everybody tries to take their money out, but because there's a harvest failure, the value of their homes falls, and most of the bank's assets is in mortgages. And so when people need money, the banks can just say, well, we can get rid of our mortgages, but they're not worth anything. So the bank collapses, right? Liquidity, right? It's all about liquidity. Okay, so this is whirling around, but it's trying to get you to see what really goes on. So the bank then constantly loans out until such time as all the reserves are necessary as a reserve for deposits. At that time, deposits would have to be a size, which was essentially the deposit, that, that those reserves with the reserve ratio were the necessary reserves of that particular size. So if there, you know, as we saw last day, if there's a, if the bank's at a reserve of $1 million, 
then and their uh, required reserve ratio, or target reserve ratio of the Canadian case, is 10%. When banks have deposits of $10 million, then the whole of the $1 million is necessary. They can't lend out another cent. It's over, right? They can't lend out anymore. And if that can actually happen, that sometimes contributes to crises, because when the bank is at that swollen point, somebody might need to borrow money. And they say, hey, I need to borrow money. The bank would say, guess what? We can't lend you money. Our reserves are spoken for. And in a lot of banking crises, that's exactly what happens. There's, and so the people realize what you do in a banking crisis, because the banks cannot lend anymore, what do you think happens? The central bank lends banks money or cash or somehow gets more reserves into the system. The key is the size of reserves. And reserves are changed by the central bank. All right, now, in Canada, our banks are big. They don't borrow. Now imagine this. That a person borrows the reserve. You go to a bank and say, you know, what kind of reserves have we got? Well, actually, we don't have very many. We borrow our reserves. What? What are you talking about? You borrow your reserves. I want you to have reserves, right? That's what it's all about. But in the US, that's what they do. They borrow reserves. Banks borrow reserves. And it's the way the system works. It's, it makes sense under normal conditions. But in Canada, our banks don't borrow reserves. They don't borrow very much from the bank in Canada at all. They have their reserves, and they have their reserves basically in cash. And they control them. What that means, actually, is the Canadian banks are pretty, like, relatively independent of the Bank of Canada in some ways. The Bank of Canada has to physically change their reserves, as we're going to see, by literally decreasing the cash that banks have. Whereas in the US, the Federal Reserve just says, um, we're going to lower, we'll lend you, you know, we're going to lend you reserves at a half a percent less. Right? So the interest rate we lend at, this is called the Federal Funds Rate, is one and a half percent. And the Federal Reserve just says, now we'll lend you reserves at one percent. That immediately causes the interest rate in the market to change because banks borrow these reserves. In Canada, the Bank of Canada has sometimes said, okay, people, we're going to lower the, the, the interest rate by one percent. And the banks just say, actually, we're not going to do that. Buzz off. You want to lower the interest rate? You better physically reduce the cash in our vaults, right? And the way that the Bank of Canada does that is by buying and selling bonds, because that's really the only thing they buy and sell. They're a big bank. They hold as, they essentially, they're like a bank. They print notes. That's their liabilities, supposedly. And their assets are government securities that they buy. Okay? So basically, if the Bank of Canada, as we're going to see, wants to increase legal tender, the Bank of Canada buys bonds. If they want to decrease legal tender, they sell bonds. Okay, so back now that we're going to go forward, what you guys think? Money, uh, money, liquidity, money supply, currency in circulation plus deposits, otherwise understood as Currency in circulation plus reserves divided by the reserve ratio at equilibrium. All right? Uh, how can then we change the money supply? Three ways. Change the reserve ratio. Only happened 15 times or so in Canadian history from 1935 to 85. And now we can't change the reserve ratio because we don't have one. Number two, change the currency in circulation that is held by the public. That can happen. We'll discuss that in a problem I'm going to give you in a minute. It happens occasionally, um, as I gave you an example. Number three, the one that's dominant and the basis of monetary policy, change legal tender. Bank of Canada changes legal tender. All right? Then, now we're going to do it. Like this. So I go into all this junk here, blah, 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 blah. Okay? And we have this. Did I give 